I try to remember names. I, I, some semesters I have as many as 400 students at different campuses. So I tell them I'm always going to call the roll and I want you to answer and look at me and smile and I want to get a name and a face together. Maybe just having you answer the roll might help fix your face and name together. For I tell them as a historian, I seem to remember the names of dead people better than I do living people. And then after that, I'm not sure if they want me to remember their name or not. But I'm, I'm, I'm working on your names. I, I am forgetful, I'm sorry to say. My wife and I were in an accident back in 1993 and we had to have some physical therapy. And I was looking over the notes that the physical therapist had dictated about me about 10 years later. I always knew I was forgetful, but I actually, I'm certifiably forgetful. Uh, Marianne Weiss, a registered physical therapist, said about me, however, he does have somewhat of an absent-minded professor personality and he tends to forget the things taught to him. Talking about the exercises I was supposed to be doing. Says he has to constantly remind himself with written notes or other memory joggers. So I know now why I forget things, it's, it's official. Maybe you don't have that affliction. But if I ask you to repeat your name, please don't, don't think I'm not interested enough in you. I, I do want to remember your name. And please make yourself known to us. Jeremiah has been a fascinating book to me ever since I was introduced to the book by an old Lutheran professor at Gettysburg Seminary years ago. Dr. Myers was an interesting fellow. He had actually retired. I think he was in his late 70s by then. He would retired, but uh, the man who was supposed to teach the book of Jeremiah that fall broke his arm in August and wasn't mending too well, and uh, so they summoned old Dr. Myers out of uh, retirement to teach the course of Jeremiah. Now, I was a Western Methodist preacher at that time, attending there, taking classes, and I'll just be real honest with you, I wasn't terribly uh, expecting to get a lot out of the class, but boy, was I in for a ride. I didn't realize how much there is in the book of Jeremiah, old Dr. Myers. I. I took his class uh, in the morning when he lectured on Jeremiah, and then in the afternoon I, I took a uh, sort of a tutorial in Hebrew morphology with him. And he said, well, he said, I want to see if you can read Hebrew. I'd already had a few years of Hebrew by then. He said, bring your Hebrew Bible and meet me in my house at such and such a time on a certain day. So I drove 37 miles from Hagerstown, Maryland, up over the, the Sunshine Trail, as we call it, and into Gettysburg. And, went up and rang the doorbell and uh, I was uh, met by Puffy the cat, a humongous cat Dr. Myers had. Uh, I don't think he heard the doorbell ring, but the cat did and the cat's inside staring at me through the screen door and I'm staring in at the cat. And uh, it was all right, I could hear him running his motor, he was purring pretty loudly. And, and then Dr. Myers called me in and he, uh, uh, he summoned me to a seat and while I was sitting there, He's tamping tobacco in his pipe. Now this is a Lutheran pastor, a Lutheran seminary professor of 40 some years. And he looked over at me while I was doing that. Now he said, Brother Kaufman, he says, I know you don't approve of this, but he said, I grew up in Lancaster County, Pennsylvania, where we grew the stuff. And he said, as a matter of fact, he said, I learned to hate it and that's why I burn it up. That gave me a new perspective on pipe smokers. And then he took me up to his office, and uh, he had an old desk there with a fluorescent lamp on it. And you know, fluorescent lamps always have a transformer to reduce the voltage. And that cat would get up on top of the desk and sit under the heat of that transformer. The fluorescent light would hum, the cat would hum, and I would sit in the corner with my Hebrew Bible, and I hummed my way through the book of Jeremiah in Hebrew. But I said all that to say this. My old father-in-law, who died at the age of 93, a retired coal miner, had a bit of wisdom one day. He said, any blind hog can find an acorn once in a while. And that showed me that even a liberal can find some good things in the Bible that are worth paying attention to. And old Dr. Myers, he's, I'm sure he's dead now, probably been dead for years, but I'd, I'd like to thank him posthumously for introducing me to the man Jeremiah and to the book of Jeremiah. I see a lot of young people here this afternoon and I'm, and I'm happy for that. I see some gray beards too as you would be referred to in ancient Israel. 
we sort of have a nice contrast here. We've got the young and we've got the elderly and a few in between. If you're not sure where you fall today, we'll put you in the in-between bracket. But I'm glad for the young people who are here today because I think I have something to say to you uh, from the life of Jeremiah the prophet. Professor Skinner who was an old professor in Scotland back in the 19th century. He said this about Jeremiah. You recall when Jesus was on earth, they were trying to figure out who he was. And someone came up with the idea that this might be Jeremiah come back from the dead. Sometimes they thought he was Elijah. You remember that every once in a while they would say, well, this is Elijah come back. And others thought he might be Jeremiah, Jesus and Jeremiah. Interesting corollary there. An old Professor Skinner said this, said Jeremiah was likest Jesus of all the prophets. And that sort of hooked my attention. What is there about Jeremiah that made him so much like Jesus, that he would be likest Jesus of all the prophets. Well, you have your Bibles open to Jeremiah, and I want to start reading a few verses for you. Here we go, verse 1. The words of Jeremiah, the son of Hilkiah, of the priests that were in Anathoth in the land of Benjamin, to whom the word of the Lord came in the days of Josiah, the son of Ammon, king of Judah, in the thirteenth year of his reign. Then it gives us some historical data. We go on down to verse 4, Then the word of the Lord came unto me, saying, Before I formed thee in the belly, I knew thee. And before thou camest forth out of the womb, I sanctified thee. Yes, people, we do believe in predestination. Just because the Calvinists have perverted the concept, we Wesleyan Arminians tend to veer away from it. You don't hear very much preaching and predestination in our ranks, do you? But there is a predestination. God does tap people on the shoulder even before they're born. God has a job. In fact, let me go a step further. I believe God's got a job for every human being born on earth. God's got a job for you, young people. And it says, before I formed thee in the belly, I knew thee. That Hebrew word literally means to experience you. I know all about you, Jeremiah. And before thou camest forth out of the womb, I, and we're not talking about a second work of grace here. We're talking about to be set aside for sacred use. Jeremiah, I had a special job for you, clear from the womb. I ordained thee a prophet unto the nations. By the way, you're born into the priesthood in ancient Israel, but you're called to the prophetic office. The priesthood comes by birth. If you're, if you're of the tribe of Levi, you can be a priest. If you're of the clan of Aaron, you can be a high priest when the opening comes. But to be a prophet, you have to be summoned. Now, what is a prophet anyhow? Let me just share this with you. It's a fascinating concept, this idea of being a prophet. What is a prophet? Well, you ask most people on the street, and they'll say, oh, a prophet is somebody who foretells the future. Well, yes, they're, they're, they're right. That, that's what it means part of the time, but it means more than that. Let me show you how basic it is. Hold this spot here in your Bible and go back to the first book, to Genesis, and go to chapter 22 with me, Genesis chapter 22. And I want to show you something else that a prophet is. I'm sorry, chapter 20. This is the account in, in Genesis 20 where Abraham and Sarah have gone into a, a foreign land and he's afraid that uh, his wife might be taken into the royal harem. So they cook up this idea of telling the people of the land that she's his sister. You remember how the story went? And then God appears to uh, the king that night, this fellow named Abimelech, and uh, uh, he said to him, he said, I, I was going to, I was going to take your life, Abimelech, but he said, I've kept you from touching the woman. I've spared you. And notice in verse 6, And God said unto him in a dream, Yea, I know thou didst this in the integrity of your heart. For I also withheld thee from sinning against me. Therefore I suffered thee not to touch her. Now here's the verse I want you to see. Look at verse 7. It says, Now therefore restore the man his wife, for, she, for he is a prophet and he shall pray for thee, and thou shalt live. This is the first time the word prophet appears in all of Scripture. Do you know what a prophet is? A prophet is someone who prays for someone. That's what it said, isn't it? 
He's a prophet, and he'll pray for you. When God entrusts you with a burden of prayer, there's a sense in which you're approaching the prophetic office, friend, as an intercessor. But there's more than that. Look in the book of Exodus with me. I want you to show you something else that a prophet is. Let's go to chapter 7. When God called Moses to be his uh, leader, he was to be the captain of Israel to lead them in the Exodus. The Lord said to Moses, Moses, go down to Egypt and tell them everything that I'm going to tell you to do. Well, Moses says, uh, you know, I, I can't do that, Lord. He says, I'm a man of a, and the Hebrew literally says, a man of a heavy tongue. Bible commentators think maybe he was trying to say he was tongue-tied or something. He's not gifted with speech. He's not good with words. And the Lord says in Exodus chapter 7, verse 1, he said, See, I have made thee a god to Pharaoh, and Aaron thy brother shall be thy prophet. Thou shalt speak all that I command thee, and Aaron thy brother shall speak unto Pharaoh, that he send the children of Israel out of the land. What is a prophet in this case? It's someone who speaks on behalf of someone else. He says, Moses, I'll give you the words, you give the words to Aaron, and he'll speak them. He'll be your prophet. So with that little background, that a prophet is someone who foretells the future, someone who intercedes, and someone who speaks on behalf of another, in this case, one who is called of God to speak in behalf of God, that gives us a little background on what it's like when God says to Jeremiah, I ordain thee a prophet to the nations. Now watch what he says in verse 6. Jeremiah, I'm back in Jeremiah 1, 6. Then said I, Ah, oh, Lord God, behold, I cannot speak, for I am a child. Sounds a little bit like what Moses was saying. But the Lord said unto me, Say not, I'm a child, for thou shalt go to all that I shall send thee, and whatsoever I command thee, thou shalt speak. Be not afraid of their faces, for I am with thee to deliver thee, saith the Lord. Then the Lord put forth his hand and touched my mouth. We read about that in Isaiah, where someone's mouth was touched with coals. Remember from off the altar, here God reaches forth and touches his mouth and said, See, I have this day set thee over the nations and over the kingdoms to root out, to pull down, to destroy, to throw down, to build and to plant. And just a couple of more verses. Moreover, the word of the Lord came unto me, saying, Jeremiah, what seest thou? And I said, I see a rod of an almond tree. Then said the Lord unto me, Thou hast well seen, for I will hasten my word to perform it. So this afternoon, with the Lord's help, I want to look a little bit at this man, Jeremiah. Let's bow our heads for prayer. Lord, we thank you for your help in the service thus far. We praise thee for your presence in the service this morning and how you did help Brother Mitchell. We're asking you now that you would touch each one of us, help us to be alert and awake to what the Spirit has to say to us, and we shall give you praise and amen. I want to suggest to you this afternoon that Jeremiah was a man who, while he was a God-called prophet, he was operating under a distinct disadvantage. Because if you go back up to verse 1, it tells us a little bit about his background. It says that he came from the town of Anathoth in the land of Benjamin. Now, you may remember in Bible history that Benjamin was the smallest of the 12 tribes. So here's a fellow who's from the smallest tribe. But then on top of that, he's from a town of losers. He's from a town of suspects. I, I speak to young people all the time, and they think that there's a lot of things working against them in life. Oh, I couldn't do this. I couldn't do that. I'm just a nobody. I want to tell you today, Jeremiah, in a sense, was a nobody. He was from the town of Anathoth. In chapter 7, when we read about that great temple sermon that he preached in downtown Jerusalem, the people who listened to him said, ah, you're just a nobody. You're from Anathoth. You're from the smallest tribe and you're from the crummiest town in all of Israel. Let me tell you a little bit about Anathoth today. 
Anathoth became a suspicious place, a place of losers, a place, dare I say it here in northeastern Indiana, it was associated with hillbillies, nobodies. I used to go to my family reunion over in Orville, Ohio, and my cousins over there told me that around them lived a bunch of people from Kentucky. I'm really going to get in trouble with Brother Sutherland here. He says all they learn in Kentucky is reading, writing, and the road to Rittman. They all migrated to Ohio to get jobs in the factories, I guess. Well, if Brother Sutherland will forgive me for such an untoward illustration, I'm trying to get you to see that these people are viewed as outlanders. These are strange people. These are hillbillies. These are people from Anathoth. Well, what's wrong with Anathoth anyhow? Well, to find out, you've got to go back with me to the book of 1 Samuel, where our preacher was this morning. I sat and held my breath, Brother Mitchell, while you tramped all over my territory this morning to see if he was going to leave me a few crumbs on the table to deal with, and I'm, I'm happy you did. Uh, in the early part of Samuel, we have the call of Samuel also into the ministry, which he so well developed for us today. And he also shared with us the problems of Eli. Eli didn't have very much discernment, did he? Remember when Hannah went to the, went to the tabernacle to pray? And here she, she stands burdened down with this need she has. She's a barren woman. The worst thing that can happen to a woman in ancient Israel is to be barren, to have no children. And she goes down to the temple and she pours out her heart to God and in her prayer her mouth is moving but nothing audible is being heard. And Eli sees that. You know what his judgment was? Uh-huh. She's had too much partying. She's been drinking. And he says to her, Hannah, he says, why don't you put up your wine? Shame on you. Oh, I, I want to say shame on Eli. You talk about a lack of spiritual discernment. Oh, not so. He, she said, I, I'm a woman of a troubled spirit, a, a sorrowful heart. And finally he realizes the colossal error he made in judgment. And says, so well, the Lord grants you your request. Poor Eli is in trouble. And finally we find in, in chapter 2 of 1 Samuel, verse 27, doom is announced. And it says, there came a man of God unto Eli and said unto him, Thus said the Lord, did I, did I plainly appear into the house of thy father? That would be Aaron, when they were in Egypt in Pharaoh's house. And did I choose him out of all the tribes of Israel to be my priest and to offer upon mine altar to burn incense, to wear the ephod before me? And he goes down through there and he says in verse 29, Wherefore kick ye in my sacrifice and mine offering. And then he says, look in verse 30, Wherefore the Lord God of Israel said, I said indeed that thy house and the house of thy father should walk before me forever. But now the Lord saith, Be it far from me, for them that honor me I will honor, and they that despise me shall be lightly esteemed. And behold, the days come that I will cut off thine arm and the arm of thy father's house, and there shall not be an old man in thine house. What he says is, it's the end of the line for you, Eli. This may be a hereditary office you have, but because of your lack of discernment, because you put your sons above me, because you're such a poor excuse of a high priest, there's a day coming when there won't be any more from your house. Let me show you how that is fulfilled now. Turn over to 1 Kings chapter 1. And we see the account now of David as an old man, 1 Kings chapter 1. Now we're leading up to this town of Anathoth. I'm giving you the background of it. In chapter 1, David is an old man. He's been king many years now. He's gotten to the point where verse 1 of 1 Kings chapter 1 says he was old and stricken in years, and they covered him with clothes, but he got no heat. I guess old men have problems keeping warm. They tell me that the old timers don't mind the, the heat as much in the summer. Uh, they like the heat. My dad, I can't hardly get him to come into a room where there's air conditioning. He'd just soon be where there's no air conditioning. And here's poor old King David, and it says, They went out and found a young woman, said, Let her stand before the king, and let her cherish him, and let her lie in thy bosom, that my lord the king may get heat. Old Dr. Aberbach at Hebrew University told us one night in the class of 1 Samuel 
He said this young lady is the world's first electric blanket. And this is how it worked. Now he died, and he's old and he's dying. Notice verse 5, and Adonijah, the son of Hagit, exalted himself, saying, I will be king. Now, he is not the one to be in line. The kingship has already been promised to Solomon, the son of Bathsheba. But Adonijah decided he would like to be king. And notice in verse 7, and he conferred with Joab, the son of Zeruah, and with Abiathar, the priest. And they, following Adonijah, helped him. Now, to make a long story short, Adonijah backs the wrong guy. He backs a loser. Uh, Abiathar, I'm sorry, backs the wrong guy. And they go out and they anoint him. And the city hears of all this disturbance going out there. And they said, what's going on? Well, they said they've made Adonijah king. And Nathan the prophet goes to Bathsheba and says, wait, what's going on here? I thought Solomon was supposed to be king. And they go in and talk to David. And David said, that's right. Solomon is supposed to be king, not this Adonijah. And Adonijah is deposed. His kingship only lasted a few hours. Whenever they got Nathan the prophet and found Solomon got him anointed, all of a sudden the big party ended. And so did the favoritism of Abiathar. Notice what happens now. He is summoned before the king. And we go to chapter 2 of 1 Kings, and it says... Solomon said to Abiathar the priest, the king, Get thee to Anathoth unto thine own fields, for thou art worthy of death. You're a loser, Abiathar. You backed the wrong guy. What you've done is treasonable, and he ought to have your head right now. But because you wore the ephod, because you bear the ark of the Lord before David my father, he says, I'm not going to do that. And notice verse 27, so Solomon thrust out Abiathar from being priest unto the Lord, that he might fulfill the word of the Lord which he had spake concerning the house of Eli in Shiloh. So the story goes full circle. Abiathar is disgraced and sent back to the hometown from which Jeremiah is going to be summoned into the prophetic office. Young people, you may think you're a nobody. You may think you weren't born into the right family. You may think you don't have this going for you or that going for you. But I want you to know that God has got a job for you to do. You do what God tells you to do. You surrender your heart and will to the Lord early in life and just see what God has for you to do. Look what he did with poor Jeremiah, a nobody from a town of losers. I'll tell you what he did. He not only called him into the prophetic office, but he supported him. Oh, I tell you, it's a wonderful thing when you sense the help of the Lord. You preachers, when you get behind the pulpit, sometimes, let me, let me say this, the pulpit can be a mighty lonely place. There are some times when you're the center of attraction and yet you're awful lonely. Have you ever been wheeled into an operating room? There you are, you've been prepped and you're ready to go and they wheel you in there and that nurse pats that operating room table and says over here Sonny and you hike yourself over onto the operating room table and there they all around you none of them man or woman enough to show their face they're all operating behind masks and there you are into the bright lights you are the absolute centerpiece of their whole world and you couldn't be more alone well sometimes that's how it is for preachers the pulpit can be a mighty lonely place. My old spiritual father told me, he said, Paul, he said, there's going to be times when you're out there and you're going to be doing your best to mind God behind the sacred desk and you're going to feel all alone and you're going to feel mighty helpless. He said, you just imagine that Jesus is standing there at your right hand helping you and see if that doesn't give you a boost. And you know, I want to tell you, preacher friend of mine, I've done that many, many times. In my moment of loneliness, I just very quickly imagine the King of Kings and the Lord of Lords, the one that called me, is standing right there beside me, helping me. He promises Jeremiah that kind of help. I don't want to explain it to you in verse 11. I read 11 and 12 for you on purpose. These are rather obscure passages. Most people tend to read over them, and you ask them what it means, and they'll shrug their shoulders. For years, I had no idea how this was supposed to help Jeremiah, but one day, I got the key to it. Let me try to explain it to you. 
Read him again, first uh, in Jeremiah 1.11. Moreover, the word of the Lord came unto me, saying, Jeremiah, what seest thou? He said, I see the rod of an almond tree. Now, when is the last time a rod of an almond tree encouraged you, friend? <laughs> we don't even know what almond trees are around here. Most of the almonds my wife eats, she buys down Sam's Club, brings home. She's a nurse. She said, almond nuts are good for you. They supply something to your diet. It's good for you. You old fellows, keep that in mind. My wife, the nurse, says they're good for you. I have no idea what an almond rod looks like, but they're very common in Palestine. And Jeremiah, in a vision, apparently, God says, what are you seeing right now, Jeremiah? Jeremiah says, you know, right now, Lord, he says, I I'm seeing the rod of an almond tree. Then said the Lord unto me, thou hast well seen, for I will hasten my word to perform it. Let me explain to you, this is a little word play. Sometimes we call it a pun. The Greek people call it a paranomasia. This is a play on words. But you have to understand the two words in the Hebrew or it goes right over your head and you don't understand what the point is. The word for almond rod, the ancient Hebrews called it the shokade, the almond rod. It comes from a verb shakad, which means this. It means to hasten or to watch over. Let me explain it to you. If you and I were to live in Palestine, up in the high country, and Jerusalem is in high country, I've seen pictures of Jerusalem with an inch of snow, a powdering of snow. It does snow in Jerusalem, believe it or not. Even in that hot, dry country, they do get some snow there. And up in those higher mountains of central Palestine, there's the almond rod. And early in the spring, almost late winter, the very first tree to put forth any blossoms are the almond trees. I've never seen an almond blossom. I guess maybe I've seen some pictures in Bible dictionaries. But the point is, they shoot forth their blossoms and their leaves ahead of anything else. It's like all of nature is still asleep, and here's the almond tree wide awake. Its buds and its blossoms are out peeking around, perhaps even over a powdering of snow, just sort of watching the rest of creation asleep, the rest of nature asleep. And so the ancient Hebrews, seeing this early blooming, decided to call the almond tree the shakod, that which watches over. It's looking over things. It's hastening. It's ahead of everything else. God says, you've seen the early one. You've seen the watcher. And he said, Jeremiah, I'm watching over my word to hasten it and to perform it. Your job is to get the word out, Jeremiah. My job is to take care of it. I'll watch over it. I like what I heard someone say about God's Bible, God's holy word. He said, God's holy word is like a lion. You don't have to defend it. Just turn it loose. <laughs> I like that. Now, here's the king of the beasts. They call the lion the king of the beasts. When I was a boy and I don't know, it must have been early in school, because this is so dumb, only somebody early in school would hear it. We used to go out in the playground and somebody would say, where can an 800 pound gnat go? A gnat, G-N-A-T, one of those little insects. Where can an 800 pound gnat go? And the answer was, anywhere he wants to. And I thought of the lion. Where can the lion go in the jungle? The answer is simple anywhere he wants to. Where can God's holy word go? Anywhere it wants to. It's like a lion. You don't have to defend it. Just turn it loose. Do you know why? Because God is watching over it. He's hastening his word to perform it. Jeremiah, he said, I've called you. I'm going to back you up. I'm standing with you. I'm going to support you. Young friend of mine, you may not be handsome, when I was in college, I was envious of all the good-looking guys, the weightlifters, the fast guys, the ones that could run, the ones that could wrestle. I couldn't do any of that very well. I was one of those kids that when they picked up members for the softball team, I was always the last one picked. Nobody wanted me on their team. You could count on me for three quick strikes in and out. Anybody here like that today? Don't put up your hand. You may not be handsome. 
You may not be gifted. My, listen to Brother and Sister Nichols sing here a little while ago. I wish I could sing like that, Brother Nichols. I can't do that. And I watched the sister over here playing the organ and the piano. People are gifted. It'd be easy for me to be envious. I don't have that kind of talent. But you know what? You've got to be you, and I've got to be me, and just see what God can do with you. You may be a little on the heavy side. Some of us are a little better upholstered than others. You may be on the thin side. You know, in the early days of our nation, 1789, when George Washington was declared the winner of the election and he became our first president, there was quite a debate among the leaders in the Senate as to how to refer to our new president. Remember, we had just broken away from George III and all of that aristocracy and that regal thinking in England. And so somebody hit upon the idea of calling him His Excellency when they referred to the president. Washington would have none of it. Well, a few years later, John Adams was elected. Now, John Adams was short and dumpy and uh, rather large around the middle. So his uh, political enemies tried to come up with a name for him, and one of them said, let's call him His Rotundancy. I don't know how you're shaped today, I don't know what your talents are, but I want you to know that God will stand with you, friend. I will never leave thee nor forsake thee, oh, the faithfulness of our God today. On June the 10th, there was an obituary for a fellow by the name of Robert McGuire. How many of you read the obituary of Robert McGuire? See there, I don't see one hand. Frankly, I didn't expect to. Unless you happen to follow Judaism, if you like to study the Jews, you may have perked up because in the obituary, it mentioned that he was the leader of Operation Magic Carpet. What is Operation Magic Carpet? Well, this has to do with 40 or 50,000 Jews who had been being persecuted for about 1,300 years, 1,400 years, down in the little country of Yemen, the Yemenite Jews. Anybody ever heard of Yemenite Jews? You wonder anything about them? They got isolated down there. They were part of the Babylonian captivity in, in the diaspora when the Jews got spread out around the Mediterranean world. The Yemenite Jews got caught down there somewhere in the Arabian Peninsula. And after the rise of Islam, they had to get along with uh, the followers of Muhammad as best they could. Sort of isolated in the northern part of, of Yemen. Well, for all these years they had been reading their Old Testaments. Isaiah chapter 40 verse 31, God has promised that he would summon his people from the north and the south and the east and the west and he would cause them all to be reunited in Israel, and he said he would bring them on wings of the eagles. And these Yemenite Jews had read that. Now let me explain to you, first of all, where they get their name. Yemen is an interesting word. It comes from the same word as Benjamin. Those words are closely related in Hebrew, and here's how it works. I want to talk to you about a map. You've looked at a road map. I looked at one coming over here yesterday. Just about every map you see, somewhere off in the corner above the legend where they tell you how much is a mile and how many inches makes a kilometer and all this, what we call the legend, there's always an arrow pointing up and it says north. Almost every map you look at, it'll show you where north is. We Westerners, we Americans, we tend to box our compass by north. Find out where north is and you can figure out where other things are. That explains why Major League Baseball diamonds are laid out with the pitcher facing to the west. Did you know baseball fields are laid out in a certain direction? Our brother here a while ago was testifying about the, those great St. Louis Cardinals. Well, I could tell him about the 1960 Pittsburgh Pirates. We'll talk about that some other time, maybe. You see, Major League pitch, pitchers sometimes are referred to, if they're left-handers, they have a nickname. Anybody know what the 
Anybody what, know what you call a left-handed big league pitcher? There's a name for him. He's called a southpaw because the way the diamond is laid out, as he faces the correct direction, his left hand is always pointing to the south when he's on the pitcher's mound. Isn't that a marvelous piece of trivia for you to take home with you this afternoon? I'm really proud to be able to share that with you. Now, forget about baseball and southpaws. I want to tell you this. In the mind of the Jew, they don't box their compass by north. It's always by the chedem, by the east, by the rising of the sun. If you were to stand, and we couldn't do it, but if you could stand in the Holy of Holies, in the temple, on the Temple Mount in Jerusalem, you would face out through the holy place, you would line up on the altar of incense, on the altar of burnt offering, through the eastern gate, across the Kidron Valley, and out onto the Mount of Olives. That's the way the temple was laid out. Every time they pitched the tabernacle in the wilderness, it was always facing east. The hope of a new day sort of bespeaks the resurrection. A better day is coming. And so when, the, when Jacob's wife, Rachel, gave birth to Benjamin, he called him the son of his right hand. And so if you box your compass looking to the east, Yemen is to the right. Yaman means to the south. These are the southern Jews. And I walked you through all that so you know now what a Yemenite Jew is. They're a Jew from the southern end of Arabia. If you stood in the Temple Mount, your right hand would point toward them to the south. Getting back to the obituary of Robert McGuire. I'm trying to tell you that God will be faithful, friend. He told the Jews way back in about 730 some BC that after you're scattered, I'll regather you on the wings of eagles. They weren't even scattered yet. That's why liberal scholars have so much trouble with the book of Isaiah. They wonder how he can predict a return when they haven't gone anywhere yet. That's where prophecy comes in. God, moving through Isaiah, motivated him to talk about the return. In 1948, David Ben-Gurion in May read the Declaration of Independence of the new nation of Israel. And fortunately, Harry Truman had enough sense to recognize them, and as soon as he did, everybody else did. They all got on the bandwagon and recognized that Israel would indeed be a nation. Immediately, the Arabs declared war from every quarter. In the midst of all this, somebody said, well, since we're regathering our folk, what about the Yemenite Jews? And so, starting uh, uh, later on that year, they started a massive airlift to bring about 40 or 50,000 Jews back to Jerusalem. They had to walk hundreds of miles down to Aden, a city in southern uh, uh, Yemen, and uh, the Jewish Joint Resolution Committee made a contract with the Alaska Airlines and Captain Bob McGuire was the chief pilot. He was chief of operation for what came to be known as Operation Magic Carpet. He just died on June the 10th at the age of 94. They got together a whole fleet of DC-4 airplanes and they began flying 1,400 miles one way and down to Yemen to the city of Aden where these old Yemenite Jews with nothing more than the clothes in their back had almost fought their way down to get there to the rendezvous point where they would be picked up. Now these Yemenite Jews were pretty primitive. They were nomadic. They certainly hadn't flown on airplanes before. But every, everybody involved in the operation was amazed at how utterly passive they were when these big flying airplanes would land there and shut off the engines and the props would finally stop spinning and the door would open. For whatever reason, above the door leading into the fuselage of the airplane, they had either a decal or a painting of an eagle with outstretched wings. And those Jews looked up and saw that, and that rang a bell with them. That seemed to click with Isaiah chapter 40 that I'll bring you back on wings. They saw those outstretched wings and said, God's come for us. They began flying those DC-4s all the way back under enemy fire. Captain McGuire said they had to fly 
so low, trying to stay under the early primitive types of radar, often taken flack. Ben-Gurion called him the Irish Moses. The Irish Moses, what is it? It's another exodus. God is leading his people out of the ancient country of Yemen. Miriam Midster was one of the stewardesses on board, and she said, as those planes would land and taxi up to the tarmac at Tel Aviv airport, those little old Yemenite ladies would pick up the border of their stewardess's jacket and kiss the hem of it, pronounce a blessing on them, then go down the steps and kneel down and kiss the concrete of Tel Aviv airport. Flak landing all around, they couldn't even leave the plane sitting there. They would fly on to Cyprus to be refueled and back again. Between 40 and 50,000 Jews were hauled over a period from June of 1949 to September of 1950. God said, I'll bring you home. And he brought him home. A friend of mine, <clears throat> hang in there this afternoon, God will stand with you. He said to Jeremiah, you may be from Anathoth, you may be from a small tribe, you may be from a disgraced town, a town of nobodies, but I've got a job for you to do, Jeremiah, and I'll stand with you. I'll watch over you, Jeremiah. I'll support you. I'll underwrite you, and I'll bring you through. And young person, an older one as well, God's going to bring us through. Praise his holy name. Shall we stand together in closing?